conference themes are very serious and important. And in a nutshell, uh, they say everything. Uh, first, that uh, the environment for education is changing, but it's full of competing views. This is really, really important. You know, what is good education, what is essential, is highly contested. And before COVID, 90%, over 90% of educators in schools and in higher ed resisted online, uh, thinking it was less uh, than in-person. You know, the golden standard was in-person classrooms in traditional uh, classrooms. And in Greece, you had a law that didn't allow for online learning in the undergraduate program, which is, you know, symptomatic of a mind set about what online means. So, you know, you, you talk about uh, in your uh, themes that education continues to change, but in fact, it hasn't changed for many centuries. You know, it's been exactly the same as it's been decade after decade after decade. What's made a difference now are what we call the affordances of the digital and much more uh, intense globalization. And, and you have captured that. These are both very important things that are also contested, highly contested, uh, both those issues are here in America and, and particularly there uh, in Greece as well. And the other thing you talk about in, in your conference theme is that the word democracy. How, how, what does democracy mean in teaching and learning? And from my experience, our experience in Greece, we know how important that is uh, for those who have been educated in the Greek culture and have sensibilities about the meaning of that term. And, um, you know, the last, uh, few, the last couple of months, I've been involved in two external uh, evaluation and accreditation panels. So I got a sense of what people are dealing with in the university sector, in, in colleges of education at least, um, during the COVID period. And I have to tell you, that al although there were challenges, there was something else in the air. You know, there was a stirring of creativity, a, s a different kind of engagement. But one thing that everybody told us, you know, faculty, staff, students, graduates, they all said they valued a humanistic education and a democratic education over what they regarded as technocratic. Right, and often online was put in that technocratic bucket that it was, you know, because it was cheaper or, you know, it was going to displace teachers. There were lots of fears about it. But it, it, it was, Greek educators seemed to hold very dear those two values. And also the other thing that came through in both these meetings, as in other meetings that I've had before in universities in Greece, is the very close interpersonal relationships that exist between students and faculty that most of uh, the information about how they're progressing and how the program is going and, and what their future is about, you know, how it's going to, uh, and where it's going to take them is based on informal communication and interpersonal relationships. But what I saw in these last two departments of education that we evaluated is that the, the administrative units really valued the affordances of the digital for the efficiencies it brought them and the systematization of the records and all the other uh, paperwork that they had to do. Also, the communication with students that couldn't be in, in the place had grown uh, more, more intense and there was a, a lot of thinking about how to engage students in these environments in the way that people don't think about how to engage in a lecture hall, for example, uh, even though we say we do. Uh, and there was a lot of curating of resources and sharing, a, a, a new collaborative culture that I saw there, and teams. So uh, the technical people had to work with the staff, had to work with the faculty to design and deliver teaching and learning. And there was a new willingness to explore. Some, of course, wanted to go back to that interpersonal, but it, there was kind of a different uh, orientation to these last two evaluations. And so I'm, that's in my mind today uh, as I talk to you. But if we turn to my, uh, um, to the, I think it's slide two, 
Oh, yes, here we go. Uh, I think it's a slide after that. That's right. I want to start off with a definition so that we're kind of, you understand where we're coming from. Online learning for us means learning interactions that are supported by connected digital devices. They, they, that can happen in face-to-face -face environments. It can happen via chats and peer reviews and simulations. It can be in person or remote. The second slide, the next slide, please. Right, so what is remote learning? Remote learning is learning at a distance in space. Um, so we could say uh, that historically, uh, remote learning has meant sending out material in the mail, right? And, and then people having to engage that in the mail or in the Australian context, it was done by radio. It was, you know, radio lessons that went out to students in remote communities. Next one. Uh, definition two, the virtual. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it, it, we are talking about uh, meanings in dis, uh, at a distance in space and time. So there's uh, that both of those uh, factors are into play. But you could say that Marco Polo writing about his trip to China and other people reading it all over the world was also virtual. That paintings that come from all over the place or architecture is also virtual uh, in the images that circulate about it. So then there's nothing new about virtual in that sense. What is revolutionary is the word digital, and that is the manufacturing of meaning, right? With the same binary encoding for images, text, and sound. In the past, if you wanted uh, to produce something uh, in writing, you had to have uh, you know, a printing press and all the technology that went with it. If you're into photography or images, it was a very different technology, a different technology for sound. But now you just click the same device, the same device, the, the same means in order to manufacture meaning. And this is the most revolutionary and the most powerful affordance of the digital, which we as educators have to recognize and harness. So the next one. So in our definition, uh, we could go to the next, the, thank you. So for us, online is not synonymous with remote. It has different modalities. It can be in person with online support or it can be remote. Now these semantics are really important because the online infrastructure and the pedagogical potentials are the same whether you're in person or remote. And we're gonna talk about that uh, 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 soon. So my next slide. Right, so what I'm going to do now is just to kind of put you in a contest, give you a very short version of a surprisingly long history, uh, the digital transformation. So the first thing I'm gonna share with you, the next one, next slide please. Uh, is that in 1959, at the University of Illinois, where we are now, uh, the first learning system named Plato uh, uh, was invented. And by 1960, they had put all the elements together. That was 60 years ago that this first, uh, first Plato uh, tool was invented. And what did it offer us? It invented the keyboard. And the keyboard allowed language to be carried by a computer. He gave us the plasma screen, which is used everywhere now in medicine for MRIs and all sorts of things. But what it, it did, it, it allowed us to pixelate image and text. It also way back then had a touch screen to it. Uh, by the time they patented uh, the uh, um, Plato system in 1964, it was a very complex uh, uh, tool. Now, these were foundational technologies, right? Because they allowed terminals to talk to each other, right? Um, uh, from one, uh, one person could talk via a computer from one terminal and another person could talk back to them from another terminal. This was extraordinary. And talking became typing in real time, like in synchronous uh, relationships. 
So these inventions way back then, 60 years ago, anticipated learning analytics. And this is an important affordance of the digital uh, because when you work in, uh, in these kinds of digital spaces, they leave traces, right? Traces that are incidental that be con collected and organized. And uh, they introduce uh, uh, mechanisms like chat or what they then called talkmatic, which was also very revolutionary. So just to go to my next slide, on the, on the uh, right hand side is, some of you might know this, is Mosaic. Uh, the U of I invented uh, the first word, word browser in uh, 1993. And on the, on the left hand side in 1998, they also introduced the first fully online uh, human resource education uh, project. And now if we, I take you to my next slide to the present, um, where are we now in, in 2012? Well, um, uh, we now have, oh, sorry. 2012 eight years ago. Uh, 20, 2012, sorry, eight years ago, but it's in recent times, Phil's correcting the date. Um, we have at the University of Illinois now, 5.8 million MOOC students since 2012, right? Extraordinary. And our own programs and courses are both in MOOC form and in the college. And I think, Bill, we have 30,000, about 30,000 students in the MOOC? I oh, know, over uh, 130,000. 130,000 students who participate in our MOOC programs from all over the world, from little villages in Africa, in, in Spain, in China, where, you know, it's just extraordinary. And in 2017, we introduced in the College of Ed, the first, and you know, might be a bit surprising to you, the first fully online doctorate program uh, in, in the form of an EDD. So now when students come to the U of I, which is a research one prestigious university, they can go from a MOOC, which is free, all the way through to any kind of uh, um, course or, or program to a doctorate. Very flexible uh, choices for students and importantly, for, uh, different price points, uh, including free. So in terms of democracy and access, this is a very important development. So um, my next slide says uh, we've arrived uh, at COVID and suddenly everybody is remote. In America, and I don't know, maybe there too, they called it emergency teaching and learning, which indicates that they think it's going to go away, right? <laughs> that, that was the, the thinking when officially it was called emergency teaching. But uh, what we want to say to you my, in our next slide is that a crisis in our education was about to happen anyway, right? Why? Because of three issues, right? And the first one is access. Who gets to go to university? Who gets to have the privilege of accessing what higher education either at the college or university level allows you. This is a very important democratic point um, and how do we allow for greater forms of access. The second one is resourcing and in your country and in America uh, the funding issues and the cost escalation of education has become challenging for all institutional issues and that is something that we have to take into account uh, both for you know the cost to the student and the cost the budgetary implications for the university but the third one is equally important and we call it attentional right the digital requires a very different and higher level of cognitive load and multi multitasking and we have to prepare learners for that and take advantage of what is possible the cognitive load in conventional classrooms and lecture halls was very low and typically it did not engage learners. One of the things I, he I hear when I go to these uh, external uh, evaluation panels is everybody wants bigger halls, bigger lecture halls, uh, which goes against kind of the logic of student centeredness. They, everybody talks about student centeredness, but on the other hand, they want bigger lecture halls where they can lecture directly to students. 
So student certain it does not work with one teacher and 30 students. It just, it's impossible. The architecture and the traditions make it impossible. So uh, if we can just move to my next style, uh, what can we do, right? In, I think Mario said this too, uh, more than support remote, what can online contribute to learning? What is different about it? What are its affordances? And that's what we're um, uh, going to uh, talk about now. And I'm going to uh, turn over to Bill for this part of it. Okay, thank you. And could you could we move to the next slide? Um, so I'm going to start with a counterpoint, which was what are the foundational artifacts of modern education? Next slide. So one of them is the lecture. And in fact, it's not what happened in, in the Academy of Athens. Um, it's, a, it's an early, or it's a medieval invention which becomes a, a modern invention. Um, here is this famous quote of St. Benedict, the founder of Western monasticism. You know, belongeth to the master to speak and teach and the disciple should be silent. Well, you know, that's what a lecture theatre is where you know, there's a lot of people sitting there um, and they're listening to the teacher. What a classroom is. Students are silently listening to the teacher. There isn't a lot of opportunity for interaction. That's a, 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 you know, a modern discursive form that we're very, very familiar with. Next slide. The second um, discursive artifact, the second artifact of modern education um, is the textbook. This is a foundational um, text, this one. It's by Petrus Ramus, a 16th century um, uh, writer. Um, and this is actually his rebuilding of Euclid, right? Euclid's geometry, but it's completely unlike the original Euclid. And then he starts with the simplest things and goes to the harder things, um, breaks it up into little chunks of paragraphs, and then all the students do the same course. They're on the same page at the same time. And this is a didactic text, which has taken the principles geometry and laid them out in this, uh, if you like, a kind of a transmission mode. It's, it's the simplification. Now, Petrus Ramus is one of the most famous, uh, or one of the most published authors of early modern time and completely forgotten. He did you know, rhetoric as well and everything else that was part of the early modern curriculum um, were constructed by Petrus Ramus. Uh, or reconstructed in this, this modern uh, textual form. Next slide. And the third um, uh, kind of um, artifact is the test. How do we know what you've learned? Well, you've, you've listened to the lectures and you've read the textbook, and then what we do is we put you in to see what you've remembered. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, you know what? These people are all close together. When you're in a lecture theatre, you're sitting beside somebody. Uh, when you're watch reading a textbook you may well be together um you might you need not necessarily be but you may be in the same classroom with the same textbook but please don't talk because it'll disrupt the class and here we are in a test where yes we're all together but we mustn't look at each other's work and we mustn't um so the irony is you know we've just been through this environment of social distancing that these were environments which constructed social distance, even though people were proximate, even though they were close enough to get germs from each other, um, uh, they were they were made distant by these kinds of textual artifacts. Next slide. So this is the model, right? This is the architecture of didactic pedagogy. Um, close in space, but socially distant. There are all the students, there's the teacher, it's a hub and spoke model like a wheel, except there isn't a wheel, there's only as many spokes. Um, and it's what um, John Dewey called transmission learning. It's what Paolo Freire called banking education, where one size fits all. We're listening to the, lecture, the same lecture. We're watching, reading the same textbook. We're doing the same test standardization. Next slide. Then online learning arrives. And by the way, remember our definition of online, it's not necessarily remote. And next slide, nothing happens same pedagogy. We have e-textbooks, we have video lectures which reproduce what St. Benedict pr prescribed, um, and we have tests, and they're all the, the kids lined up in the class with the teacher at the front um, with their headphones on, not talking to each other. So we can actually replicate these, these traditional didactic pedagogies in, in, with, with online learning. And in fact, on the right is an image from B.F. Skinner's teaching machine of 
1954. And sometimes online learning means we go from bad to worse. Things don't get better. We, we just fossilize those old practices. Next slide. Um, yeah, so there are the three artifacts simply replicated. Distancing, intrinsic to didactic pedagogy, video lectures, e-textbooks, online tests, all the same. Next slide. Now, what we want to argue, and I'm not going to do this now in any detail, I'm just going to mention these ideas because uh, come and join us in the course because the course will deal with these, these seven ideas. These are seven things that we can do um, which are possible in the online environments. In fact, they were possible before online environments as well, but they were just really hard to do. So often we slip back into what was easiest. Now they become easier to do, and digital technologies make it possible. Um, and perhaps we should. Multimodal meeting, which is, Mary mentioned that before, you know, we can use these new media to have uh, students working in text and video and image and diagram and infographic and all the like. Um, I'll go around the circle um, anti-clockwise. We can have students as active knowledge makers, not just passively watching the video and reading the textbook. Um, we can have ubiquitous learning, which is it doesn't have to be bound by the four walls of the classroom or the cells of the timetable. Differentiated learning, you know, we can have quite complicated arrangements where not all students are on the same page at the same time, doing the same work at the same time, uh, where they can choose according to their interests or, or work um, according at the speed that matches their ability. Metacognition, we can have environments where you're just not absorbing content, but thinking about our thinking. Collaborative intelligence, we don't have to have these as anti-social environments. We can work together in social learning contexts. And finally, recursive feedback. We can bring, bring systems where you don't just have to wait till the end of the semester to do the test. You're getting formative assessment the whole way. So these become our new agenda for uh, learning assessment, um, which, as I say, in the course, we're going to go into each of these uh, in quite a bit of detail. So, Bill, Bill, before you move on, can, can I say that assessment is key, right? Assessment drives curriculum. Uh, but what we're presenting to you today in this very brief form is not polarities. We, the, the, at basis, what, what we're trying to say is that uh, educators needed to expand their repertoires and to know what's appropriate uh, for particular students, for groups of students, for particular subjects, uh, and what are the affordances available to us uh, from of the digital that can allow us uh, to enhance uh, what we're doing with learners in their difference. Next slide. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and show you an example of this work. And this is um, a project that Mary and I have been working on called Common Ground Scholar, CG Scholar. So we've been working on this for quite a number of years now. And we, we've had a number of research grants. We've been very lucky to have plenty of um, uh, funding to, to build out uh, a model of what might be different. And as a matter of fact, in the course, we're going to use this platform um, uh, as well. Um, to harness the affordances uh, and with a humanistic perspective. So um, I'm going to go over now. Um, if we could, um, Dino, if you could just switch, switch over to the, uh, the web browser, and I'm going to give you, show you into it. So I'm just waiting for it to come up. Uh, and I will try to. Uh, have we managed to find the screen there, Dino? It's on. Okay, I can't see it. So I'm just assuming you folks can see it. All right. So, okay. So um, I hope you're seeing uh, the, the, the login page now. <laughs> um, just uh, Dino, keep on telling me in the in the chat if it if it's working. Um, I'm running running kind of blind now. Um, okay, so I've got a number of tabs open here, and when we log in, what we see starting off is uh, an application that we call Community. So this is the first one that's highlighted there. Um, uh, and in that application, it kind of looks a little bit like Facebook and Twitter, and that's because it is like Facebook and Twitter, but also it's nuanced differently. I belong to communities, which may be a whole class, it might be part of a class, it might be multiple classes working together. And I don't have friends and followers, I have peers. Um, so one of the problems with usual, using social media in learning is that um, uh, you know, friends is a terrible idea, followers is a terrible idea, it's not a popularity context, so we use the metaphor of peers. But also what we try to do is each of these posts, this is a kind of a running 
uh, record of things that are happening in my communities and that my peers are involved in. Um, and we don't have, um, but, but also we give an opportunity for much more substantial posts. So these are just quick summaries. But if I go down now into one of these communities, this particular one now, which is a class that Mary and I happen to be teaching, and this is absolutely live. This is stuff that was posted by our students just a little while ago. Um, we don't have teachers, we have admins, including some of our teaching assistants there. Um, and there are 57 people who are part of this class. Teachers, now, admins if, teachers. If, if the admins are a mixture of teachers and researchers and- And, and it, tech support. Yep. So if I go down now into one of the posts, this is what we use to replace uh, the um, St. Benedict's video lecture or the textbook, right? So what we do is we've got a thing here about digital affordances, we've got an infographic, we've got a table, we've got a video that we made, which we posted in line, we've got a, a, a journal article that we wrote. But most importantly, this is not a transmission pedagogy. What we do is we ask you to interact. So, you know, using these ideas... We still see the sign-in page. No, that's not right. No. So in other words, it's not working, Dino. Sorry, you should be seeing it move. So. I'm um, sorry, we, we're now four, four pages in. So. Uh, you might just have to talk about it. No, it, 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 it's got to be shown. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, shall we do it again? Uh, shall we do it again? Okay, we'll do it again. So, how do, firstly, how do, we get, um, how do we get the page up? Ah, there we go. Let me see if the page comes up. No, not yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dino, should I stop sharing and reshare? Uh, by the way, I just want to say this is a, a horrible, horrible video platform. We use lots of video platforms. We use Zoom. We use Teams. And I've never saw, I, I, I saw this one in Brazil last week, and it's one of the it's terrible, terrible, terrible. So let me just start again. Um, Part uh, of our problem is the tool, the existing tools were never meant for what we're using them. To well, do. no, the, the but, Zoom and Teams and whatever will we'll all do this well. So this is this is not yes, but it's sensible. still trans transmission. Uh, so I'm going to go um, allow, and let me see if that comes up now. It's frozen. Oh. Ah, there we go. That's it. Thank you. Right. Wonderful. Okay, I'll go back and say that again. Apologies, folks. This is um, a very, very st strange platform. And as I say, I've only used it once before. And, <laughs> um, and we did battle with it yesterday, too, didn't we, Dean? So, okay, here's the login page. I was talking about this page here. And I just wanted, yep, oh, it's coming up. There you go. Right. Miracles will never cease. So, again, we belong to communities, not classes. Um, we have peers over here, uh, and again, oh, even my, uh, yes, even my, my mouse is, my point is showing up. We have peers, not friends and followers. We have an activity stream, which is an infinite scroll of things that are happening in my world. So it follows, follows kind of social media logic. This is a social platform. Then if I go into one of these communities, which just happens to be the one at the top of the screen, this is one of Mary and my classes. We have admins, not teachers. Include some uh, various support people as well as us, uh, Mary and me, as the teachers. Um, and we have uh, members in that group, which are the members of that community. Um, then, um, this is an example in that community of what is not um, a, um, a, a kind of a textbook and not a video lecture. So, what we've got is we've got a bit of information here, we've got an infographic about the seven affordances. We've got a table. Uh, we've got a small, a short video introducing the idea. It, we've got an article, a PDF article that Mary and I have written. Um, but most importantly, this is not about transmission pedagogy. See down here, there's a thing which is comment, which is we want you to interact with that. We want you to be part of a discussion there. That's the comment. Now, what's interesting is down below that then is People are writing really substantive stuff. They're interacting. And in a normal classroom, a lecture theatre, one person might put up their hand at the end and ask a question. But here what we've got is we've got substantial interaction by absolutely everybody, 
which you'll see in a second that we'll be able to parse with linear analytics because we expect you to be contributing to the class. But the other thing we expect you to do is also to contribute content. So we say, make an update, make a post, and take a technology or learning resource and parse it for its affordances. Now, here's one example um, of one of our students, and I just pulled this up now because um, it's, it just happened to be there a second ago, talking about the Bitmoji Classroom. Now, I, I've got to say, until 10 minutes ago, I'd never heard of the Bitmoji Classroom. So we have wonderful teachers who are doing interesting things. Um, and, you know, who are we to be the sole um, people transporting knowledge into this class? Because we want to value the knowledge that our students have as well, who are in this digital world. So here, they're, what they're doing is they're using our concept, ubiquitous learning, active knowledge making, multimodal meaning, to parse the bit, this Bitmoji environment. They put in a video about the Bitmoji environment. This is Mary's point about multimodality that she made earlier. They put in some references, which is this is serious academic work. And importantly, the other members of the class are interacting with them. So if you like, they've become co-contributors to the content of the class. We are co-designing this class with our students. This is a, a very, very social uh, environment. Let me tell you um, one more thing. Um, this is, by the way, the COVID area where we have a four-year-old. It's a weekend. It's a, 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 well, it's, it's for, the, a four-year-old on holidays who's yeah. jumping around. So, so, so this is so this I, is online learning for you. So I go Nike cinema zimas. Anyhow. Um, um, in the next area, here's, another, here's a more extended piece of work. I just want to give examples of how this social interaction happened. So this is um, a, somebody writing a piece about digital literacy and social interaction. So here it is on the left, and you can see they've put in videos. It's multimodal, um, uh, which illustrate the benefits of the bilingual brain and examples of this. And then they've done a critique uh, of the question, and they've write a conclusion, and they've got a reference list, which includes uh, heavy duty academic articles as well as all the videos they've used. But the important part about this is this is a social architecture. So for a start, what we've done is on the right hand side here, uh, we have a set of review criteria. And if I wanted to review this work as a peer, what I do is I go and I you know, pull across the slider, I look at the review criteria, I type in a comment. And in fact, these are the results. So see here, after three people have reviewed it, this is the first person comments, this is the second person's comments, this is the third person comments, and they're also it's also full of annotations, which is, you know, there's comments that people have made all the way through, um, um, and so on. Um, so this is highly social. In fact, this is a draft work, which then gets revision, revised, and the student says, look, I took on board this person's comments. So, you know, it's the opposite of cheating. You know, those, those, those students doing the test with the blinkers on their, their eyes. This is actually getting the students to assess each other and take on board each other's feedback to produce a better work which gets published in, into their portfolio. So, so this is social learning and social knowledge. This collaborative and peer-to-peer -peer is at the core of the pedagogy. Now, Mary mentioned learning analytics. What we do is we parse everything that's going on in this space. So this was a class which had you know, 50 students in it perhaps. Um, and what we do is this is every single student has this, uh, this aster plot, aster is a type of daisy. Um, and this is what they're being measured on. We're data mining all their work like so. And we're measuring them for knowledge, things that they've learned, um, which might be the average peer review, which is the judgment of their peers about the quality of their knowledge. Um, focus, which is the amount of work they've done, but also help. You know, the, the feedback they've got on their feedback, the, collabor the, the feedback they've given to others a whole lot of collaboration measures. Right. Now, so, in an online environment, it's very important not just to know what knowledge they've produced, but the degree to which they've actively engaged. So we track all that, how much they engage with the activities, and most importantly, with each other. So we give a equal weight to what we call help, the way they help each other constantly. succeed, yeah. right? And it's so important, if you talk about democracy, if you talk about humanism, if you talk about needing to solve complex problems in the world, we need to do it in a collaborative way and we need to find a way to evaluate that and measure it and give feedback to the learner about how good their feedback is and how helpful they have been. So these three components have equal weight in our assess-as-you-go uh, framework. And 
here, if I go to the bottom of the screen, in fact, in this course, which was an eight-week course, um, oh, and by the way, the circumference of the circle is our learning objectives, which is what we expect students to achieve. And we say, look, if you get an 80, you get an 80, right? So, and this is looking at the whole class, but every student has their own, and they see these analytics growing. It starts off at zero, and as they work through the course, they get closer and closer to our learning objectives. But in this course, look, there were 2,000 pieces of actionable feedback. How could we ever do that in a regular class? How could a teacher ever achieve that by themselves on half a million, uh, half a million data points? So um, this is a new way of doing assessment. It's formative, it's as you go. Every single piece of assessment contributes to your learning um, and it's assessment uh, and, which is and the learner can choose what grade they want. I mean, they can choose to keep on improving. And until even, they reach the target. Until they reach their own target. Uh, and even in some cases when students have difficulties and they can't do it uh, by, the, by the timeline, you know, uh, you know, the end of the period, as you would say in a normal classroom, uh, we make allowances for that because they can continue working in the online environment uh, in order to make up what they weren't able to do. So we allow that level of flexibility because we're recording everything and documenting everything. It's not like in a classroom where everything disappears. One last thing before we get back and do some conclusions is I want to show you what then replaces the, the textbook. So over here in this bookstore area, we have artifacts called learning modules. Um, and here are examples of our students' learning modules. They've made literally hundreds of these things, including an introduction to snake genetics, uh, planning interdisciplinary units, whole class phonics, second grade, and whatever. So our students make these things called learning modules, which are very different from a textbook. There, it's kind of where the syllabus meets the textbook, meets the learning management system, all of those things. And here's an example of a learning module that I just pulled up. Happens to be one that's come through recently, and it was there high up in my list about mixing math, math, art, and symmetry. So what the the, the person's done, this particular student, is they've created some sort of objectives, but then what they do is they have two, two sides to the screen. A, a left side, which is content for the student, a right side, which is content for the teacher. And what happens is here, they're gonna be with totem, you know, they, they create this content here on the left in the software they created, which involves images, QR codes they can scan, um, it involves videos, they put in a video there, for example, which they've uploaded. And when they press this and they select the community, the chunk of content on the left, which is dialogical prompts for classroom discussion, gets delivered into every student's activity stream and also the community activity stream. So that's a quick um, overview of, of a, a different model from the ones that I showed you in those classical artifacts. So let's go back now briefly to the slides. If we could do that, please, Dinos. I'm glad we got this working eventually. Thank you. <laughs> Despite that, here's what's possible. And five plus one learning transformations. Next slide. Um, the plus one, by the way, is a transformation for teachers. The five are for learners, right? So social learning, I think I've said that clearly enough. The little, the diagram on, up on the left, the hub and spoke one, becomes an interactive one where what the teacher does is designs the learner interactions. That's what the student done, does, uh, the, the teacher does. Uh, there are a number of other points on the, the right, which is, you know, th there's more to it than this, but that's the main point. The next one, um, number two, next slide, is equitable learning. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide. There we go. Yeah. So this is what we used to do in classes. We used to put the kids over a normal distribution curve, and this is the person who originally did it in 1920, Henry Goddard, uh, who, with IQ tests, what he did is he said, you know, if you're if you're 100, you're average. Um, 145 is genius, brilliant. But the interesting thing is the words for the ones on the left, which are morons and and uh, idiots and imbeciles, were the words used for different levels of stupidity on the left. But what we did is, students came into a, a medical course, students came into fifth grade, students came into advanced algebra. And we always wanted to put them on the, on this curve, which was a way of insisting on inequality, insisting that even though we expect you all to do the course, we want you to come out unequal. Why would we do that? So what we've done with our own analytics is said, everyone can just keep working till you reach those objectives. You might reach them at a different pace. The, the petals of the flower, the colorful flower may grow slower for you, but keep working at it and you can get there because we let you in on the assumption that you, you can get there. 
the word that, that, that used for that is mastery learning, a word invented by Benjamin Bloom 60 years ago. Next slide. Engage learning. Um, from you know, the, the point where students are passive consumers of knowledge that's transmitted to them, to students as active learners, building knowledge actively. You saw that happening in that space. Number four, next slide, deep learning. So, you know, the old fashioned thing was A, B, C, D answers at the end of the, end of the semester, item based tests. Is that deep? No, that's just remembering stuff. That's just long term memory. And by the way, who needs long term memory when, when in your pocket you've got Wikipedia? In your pocket, you've got every app you want to think about, which can calculate anything you need calculated. So do we need long term memory the way we used to? No, probably we don't. But what we do need, well, we need is, cri is critical thinking right. um, and the ability to navigate available uh, cognitive resources. Right. And that's what we're getting. That's what we want students to be doing in these kinds of online spaces, you know, um, really working towards things that like creative thinking, critical thinking, design thinking, thinking in action actionable thinking. Fifth point, which is the last point for learners, is recursive learning. We've just showed you this. Recursive means learning where you're getting many, many small cycles of interaction and learning is incremental and assessment is an integral part of the recursive process of incremental learning. Rather than waiting for the end of the semester to decide you've got to discover you've got a B plus for your course. And so last point, uh, last slide, transformative teaching. Um, so the, in this environment where we've done those first five things, teachers are more important than ever. Don't think the machine's going to replace the teacher, but their job has completely changed. They have to become people able to work in these environments, able to interpret learning analytics, which leads us to the very last and slide. And to be collaborative, uh, most importantly. Yeah, and to work in, to you know, work in these learning, what we call e-learning ecologies, yeah. these very, very social learning environments. So the future of online learning is the future of all learning. That's our conclusion. You can create a Scholar account. It's open at cgscholar.com. And our website is newlearningonline.com. And we've got a Facebook page, a Twitter page. And, and oh, that's just my email address. But Mary's the same name at illinois.edu. So um, email us. So that's our quick overview of uh, what happens after COVID, but what was going to happen anyhow, we hope.